who are focused on draining the swamp were Americans for limited government, were not Americans for perpetually growing government. And that's what happens right now. And it's a, and it's a disease that affects Washington, D.C., both Republican and Democrat. And we're going to change that. Keeping our republic is on the line, and it requires patriots with great passion, dedication, and eternal vigilance to preserve our freedoms. Jenny Beth Martin is the co-founder of Tea Party Patriots. She is an author, a filmmaker, and one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. But the title she is most proud of is mom to her boy-girl twins. She has been at the forefront, fighting to protect America's core principles for more than a decade. Welcome to The Jenny Beth Show. Rick Manning has worked in public affairs and public policy for decades, including stints with the United States Department of Labor under President George W. Bush and nearly a decade with the National Rifle Association. Rick is passionate about reducing the size and scope of government, and as president of Americans for Limited Government, he gets to dedicate 100% of his time to this very worthy cause. Rick, thank you so much for joining me today. You are the head of Americans for Limited Government, and you really like to fight for policy changes that make a difference and help limit the size and scope of government. Yeah, it's great. It really is a great opportunity to be able to kind of do what my life's led up to. You know, 40 years of being in politics and being able to spend the last 12 really focusing on limiting government, identifying where there are problems, and using whatever skills I have to try to create a systems where um, we win a few. And you know things like we took down the Obama administration's attempt to take over local zoning. Uh, it wasn't an issue that a lot of people were paying attention to, but we fought the NAACP, we fought a lot of people. And in the end of the day, we got Congress to defund it and then after four years of fighting in the Trump administration, we got the Trump administration to rip it out by the roots. So it's a, you know, it was a seven year fight. And it continues because Biden's resurrected it. But it's fact is sometimes you just get to fight battles that matter. And every once in a while, God blesses you with a win. That, that's very good. So when you're fighting, what are the kind of things that you do? What are the tactics in, that you use to fight? Well, first of all, we try to figure out where the leverage points are because every every battle is different. Um, for instance, in the um, in the AFFH fight, the zoning fight, um, we had a um, guy who was the um, Westchester County executive director who was fighting it up in Westchester County, um, a guy named Bob Astorino. And so we worked with Bob Astorino on some of his challenges in terms of the local fight. We applied them, we, and we took his you know, expert witness of what happens to county executive when they impo impose this on you and made sure it got in front of a whole bunch of members of Congress. Uh, Representative Paul Gosar picked it up and said, we want to defund this, and he, he ran the ball with it and did a great job. And I spent a lot of time sitting in Mitch McConnell's office with his staff explaining to it when we're going through appropriations processes to how what it did and why it mattered. And quite honestly, we did probably 25,000 different radio shows around the country over five years um, talking about it and making people aware of it. And ultimately, um, we had some local support that generated out of it and you kind of roll it up into a big ball and people the republicans eventually said we have to get rid of this we're going to stop it and we succeeded that's great that's very good um as you're looking to 2024 and after the presidential election in 2025 what are the kind of things you're you're looking at doing yeah we're going to have to learn, really walk and chew gum in 2024 because obviously the election matters without the election if we aren't electing a, a president who is um, limited government oriented um, if we're not electing that president in 2025 a lot of things you can plan to do in 2024 don't happen if we don't have a, a house and the senate that are limited government oriented Oriented, it's much more harder to get those things done as well. So we have to, obviously, that's a big part of the puzzle. But from a, so what we've tried to do, and there's a lot of issues that matter. Um, you know, Joe Biden's impeachment matters. You know, getting to the root of the corruption, the Jordan Weaponization Government Committee matters. Trying to deal with CISA and the, and the censorship of uh, conservative groups and censorship as a whole matters. Standing up for Israel matters. There's a lot of things that really matter that are going to be really localized fights. 
what I'm trying to do is beyond just a localized fight is pick some things that aren't sexy, like the local zoning issue, uh, that aren't that don't have a lot of you know bells and whistles and you know shiny objects that we all chase around here so much, and set them up. So should we be successful in the electoral process? We have substantive things that can be done immediately that are already laid up and are and Congress is ready to go and we, ha we have a capacity then to actually use that first 100 days to substantively change the way government does business and to drain the swamp. And so that's the kind of the three word thing that we're going to do. We're focused on draining the swamp. We're Americans for limited government. We're not Americans for perpetually growing government. And that's what happens right now. And it's a and it's a disease that affects Washington, D.C., both Republican and Democrat. And we're going to change that. And it's really not that hard. So there's and because a lot of the things have been done for Supreme Court has really done uh, yeoman's work in defining, redefining um, regulations and the kind of the, whether or not regulations have to be tied to actual legislation. And the dramatic expansion of the regulatory state is not based on, largely based upon the, um, the congressional language that passed, the stuff that passed by elected officials. And so the what, Supreme Court through a court case, West Virginia v. EPA, open the door for a complete examination of the overreach of government and those regulations. And one of the things we're going to be doing is we're going to be pressing members of Congress to engage in identifying regulations that go beyond congressional intent, identify how much money is being spent on those regulations, and using the appropriations process to put those regulations under fire in terms of being defunded. And that, getting Article One back in the game in terms of doing what they're supposed to do, that plays a huge role in this, and it sets the stage for a more conservative, limited government administration than to take actions to end those regulations um, and do so ba with constitutional basis and congressional support. That's cutting the arms off the tentacles of government. Okay, when you say Article One, what do you? It's Article One is Congress, ar it, and it's plain. It's yeah, plain. Article One is 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 Congress. That's a legislative branch. Mm -hmm. um, the legislative branch was actually devised as the most powerful branch of government. The Supreme Court was kind of wimpy. The they were afraid of a of a king, so consequently the executive branch was given really limited powers. A lot of power on the on the foreign end of things because you had to be able to negotiate treaties and stuff but very limited powers in terms of legislation. The problem is Congress over the past 100, since FDR anyway, has turned over their legislative capacity, their legislative responsibilities to the executive branch, uh, to the administrative state. They said, oh, this is too complicated for us, poor little uh, dumb congressional minds. Let's let the experts who, who you know, are working in government figure it out and they can just make regulations. Well. When you do that, you take government away from the, the people, the people who are voting, because Congress says, oh, it's a regulation, there's nothing we can do. And we have Congressional Review Act, which allows them to strike down some regulations and the like on occasion. But the fact of the matter is, the Supreme Court has opened the doors, changed that entire system by saying, if a regulation extends beyond the intent of Congress, beyond the language of the law that was, that was passed, it's no longer constitutional. And so limited government conservatives in Congress have a, not just a right, but a duty to evaluate the regulations that have been imposed on us over the last 20, 30 years and say, this one, these no longer meet the test that the Supreme Court put forward. Identify them and, and force accountability in terms of how much money they're costing and cut them, say, we're going to defund these. And by knowing how much they cost, knowing how many uh, full-time employees are gonna be involved, so you get rid of them, you're able to put a, a dollar amount on it. And then in this world, in a budget world, where they're trying to, at least they say they're trying to balance budget, I pay, it's called a pay for. It allows you, if you wanna spend money on Israel, to say, well, if we get rid of these three regulations, we've got the money for Israel. 
Now it's a you're not going to get that much money, but that's a but that's really the the idea here. Let's create a real accountability on the regulations. Let's make our legislators actually have real oversight over the regulatory process, and let's bring America back to the American voters so we get to say what gets to happen in our country, and not a bunch of bureaucrats who who their main objective is to be able to retire with a big pension and to grow their own power inside the government and look down on the very people who elect their, elect the Congress. It is, we, we have a responsibility to do that, and that's something we can get done right now, and we're gonna do it. And what all will it take for you to get it done right now? Well, it's, it's gonna take members of Congress agreeing that they wanna do it, which we're I'm meeting with members of Congress every day on that. Um, it's gonna take um, a, it's gonna take a, a effort to get some people in the legal world, um, attorney generals and others, to identify some of these regulations and start using their prerogatives as state attorney generals to go after them. Um, and so we have to do a multi-pronged fight on it. And truthfully, it's gonna take a capacity to bring, uh, to make it an agenda item for whoever ends up being the nominee, make it an agenda item inside the Republican platform. It's going to be one of those things that, um, in, in some respects, the biggest challenge of draining the swamp is the Republicans are as much part of the swamp as the Democrats. So true. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you sit there, there is a really good slogan, but um, you don't always get the support where you think you're gonna, you're gonna get it. And the point is, if you play, you have to let play an inside game to identify the problems and the outside game to get the people to come in and fix the problems. And so once again, I said, we have to walk and chew gum, big project. It's going to require, you know, I'm going to have to raise the money to fund it, obviously, but it is a, um, but it's something that's doable. It is actually doable. It's something that is, and we sit there and we, we do pie in the sky things and say, we're going to do massive civil service reform. That isn't happening. Okay, I mean, you can do a press release and you know do a, you know, stand out and in front of cameras and say you're doing it, but you're not going to do it. It's there's too many institutional blockages with this and doing some things on the civil service side. You can, in fact, change the entire way this place works. And if you didn't get anything else done in the next presidency, then that you would go down as the most meaningful president in the last 40 years. That's amazing. Do you have the this written up, like a plan for people to read it or? Well, you can read the civil service side if you go to the dailytorch.com. Um, you can read the civil service side. It's uh, four easy steps, four easy and not so easy steps can be taken to drain the swamp. Uh, an article that I put out a couple weeks ago um, where I lay out some of the, the steps on the civil service side. And what are those steps for the civil service? Side? It's relatively simple. First thing is, um, what people don't know is the health and human services under Donald Trump in December of 2020, this is the, the agency that was the point of the spear for the entire COVID thing, said, wait a second, let's, you know, we don't have very many civil servants actually working. Let's find out how many have actually logged into the computer. 25% of the civil servants in the health and human services came, never once logged into a computer from March of 2020 to December of 2020. 25%, not once. Well, it's a, so first step, let's find out with all the telework that's supposedly going on and all that, let's find out how many people are actually working. That's something that the, that the Office of Personnel Management at the White House should know. And every department has a personnel department that should know that. It's an easy thing to find out. So that, that all Congress has to do is ask. So that's some, the first easy step. Let's, let's see the scope of the people who are just collecting money and not doing work. Pretty basic. Um, second thing, there's something called the Merit Act. It's really simple. Um, Barry Loudermilk has it. Representative Barry Loudermilk from Georgia has it in the House. It is a, all it does is it allows for a faster firing process for civil servants who are lazy, don't show up to work, recalcitrant, um, or incompetent. So you can, as a, they have it in the VA right now. 
Um, people might remember in 2016, 2017, uh, the Obama administration was essentially, their VA was letting people die on the streets. Uh, veterans die on the streets. And in 2017, a bipartisan vote in Senate and in Congress passed legislation that reformed the VA. And part of it was an expedited firing process. I want to apply that fi expedited firing process across the board. It, it's a, you won't get you know, tens of thousands of people fired, okay? This is about having the people who are the managers being able to get the people who are managed to actually do their job. It's, very, it's that simple. And Can elaborate on that. Well, I, I, I could, when I was with the Labor Department um, as Chief of Staff Public Affairs, I could, have, I could name a number of individual cases where you had to make a decision. Am I gonna go through an, a year-long process of trying to get this person fired, or am I just gonna put them in a corner? And you don't go, to, you don't go in there with a, a short time frame and, a, and uh, things to get done and say, well, I'm gonna spend all my time trying to get a GS7 fired. Okay. What is the GS? A, a low level, a low level government employee, a fairly low paid, probably paid thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. I don't know now, but that was a long time ago. The point is, you're not, you're not going to spend that. What you're going to do is you're going to say, even relatively highly paid, if they aren't doing the job and won't do the job, are you going to spend a year trying to get them fired, or are you going to just put them in a corner, ignore them, let them collect their paycheck? So you can get your job, which you have to get done, your, your priorities. Because truthfully, nobody in the White House is gonna call the Labor Department and say, hey, did you get that GS-14 fired? No, they're gonna care, did you get the stuff done the White House wanted to get done? So that's what you have to focus on. The expedited firing process allows you to do just that. And it sends a message to all the other careers that they, we don't wanna have to fire anybody, that they need to do their job. They at least need to go through the motions of doing their job. And it you changes the dynamic. You at least need dynamic. to show up well, or log in. <laughs> you should, yeah, lo log in. You know, yeah, there's lots of programs you can buy to make it look like your cursor's moving around, which I'm sure many people are using. But the, but yeah, that's a. That's a <laughs> you just made people. But it's so bad. It's just that's terrible. It is. It is. I, I, but we have to fix it. That's the key. We don't know how many of those people still aren't showing up to work, or only occasionally. We have to identify the problem. So that's the first step. Second step, we have an opportunity through the Merit Act to go and do a something that allows us to fire non-performing employees. You can't drain the swamp unless you can fire the swamp. And that's something that's very simple. It is exactly what was done in the Veterans Administration when Barack Obama allowed in 2016 and 2015 veterans to be dying on the streets not being able to get appointments. And so the, in 2017, a legislation, reform legislation was done, Donald Trump signed it, where they made it a pathway to be able to fire Veterans Administration employees and weren't doing their job in an expedited fashion. This is not about being able to fire a whole bunch of employees. This is about being able to manage the employees there in a world where the Washington Post run, ran on January 20th of 2017, when Donald Trump was inaugurated, ran a full page article about resistance and urging the, the federal bureaucracy to resist the duly elected president of the United States. What that means when you're the federal bureaucracy is that you are in fact not you're not doing your job because you're supposed to facilitate the politicals. You're the lever pullers. You know how, how to pull levers power. You don't get to choose which levers to pull. What you get to do is you get to, you get to pull the levers. And the whole civil service system is set up to be supposedly nonpartisan, yet now we have, have a civil service system that's about 80-20, 80% 80, 20, uh, 80 Democrat, 80% growing government. And think about it. It's in their interest to grow government because grow bigger government means more power for them. What's more, Congress, Article I, the branch of Congress, which is Congress, has the constitutional responsibility, not just the right, it's not just the right, it's a responsibility to keep the, to do the legislation and keep a, an eye on and to rein in the bureaucratic state. So, Congress can do that, 
one thing they need to do is change the civil service laws so an employee who won't do their job can be fired. It's that simple. It's not political. There's a process. It still protects the employee rights, but it's just faster and truthfully, um, a civil somebody who's in as a political appointee isn't going to spend all their time trying to fire a, a low-level employee who doesn't do their job. Those people, because under the current system, it's a waste of time. And the one thing you don't have as a political appointee is time. You have a clock. It's a four-year clock. It's running. And the left knows that their job is to run the clock out on you. And the resistors are set there are, are trying to do that. With the Merit Act, you can deal with the resistors and you can get them out of the way and put people in place who want to do their job as set forth in the, constitutionally and through the Hatch Act. So that's a, the Merit Act. Um, the other two are relatively are bigger picture things that they matter. Most people don't realize about 7,500 career uh, SES, it's a senior executive service employees, who really run things. They are the professional managers. They get paid a lot of money. They are able to, um, they're supposed to, since Carter changed the rules, they're supposed to be able to manage any, any department, they're managed, we're professional managers. The reality is they embed themselves into specific departments. They have programs and grants that they're overseeing that, they're, that are going out to people they, they want, and they resist every time when you're trying to get anything changed in a department. First person you have to overcome is your SESs. Well, here's the truth. They're also your older employees. They've been there for a long time. They're heading towards retirement. And you sit there and you say, so if you did a simple thing by saying, we're going to do early out for all the federal employees, allowing them, we're going to say, okay, you currently have 38 years in, we're going to give you credit for 40 years in your retirement. It costs money to do that. But those people will take that two years because essentially they don't want to work the next two years for free from a pension perspective. So they'll take that, move those people out of the way and replace them with people who, A, are gonna do their job, but B, might even be somewhat supportive of what you're trying to do. So remaking the, the seniors, senior executive service, remaking the, the makeup of the people who are the resistors that matter, the real lever pullers, by remaking that through this kind of system, you create an opportunity to get your agenda done that's so that's the third thing and the fourth thing is um do a uh, reduction in force is shorthand is riff and i think people hear a lot of this word in the next 12 months um we go back to the first thing if we've got 20 percent of the people who aren't signing in aren't logging in on a daily basis when they work on a computer well you know what they don't need to have a job so you you do a reduction in force the reduction in force is simple um, you just take a, you say, okay, well, this, let's say it was 10%. I can tell you when I managed it in, uh, in the labor department, uh, public affairs department, that we had 42 employees. I could have gotten rid of 10%, and never missed them, okay? So it's not gonna change the whole makeup of government. You're, but, so you do it in a riff. Let's say it's 10%. 10% is 200,000 people. That's a significant reduction in government. It's getting rid of waste. It'll save, it would save about $40 billion a year, um, which I know in today's world is $6 trillion and we spend money on everything. And you know, Joe Biden says, wave a pen, I wanna spend $400 billion to not make people pay their student loans. That 40 billion may not sound like a lot, but it's a lot of money. It is. You go to to the average American, that's a lot of money. Well, and you go to an appropriator and you say to appropriators, hey, we're, we're, we need to slash $40 billion. Amazingly, it becomes very, very hard for them to figure out how to do that. This is a 40, that would be a $40 billion savings. And you wouldn't miss it, is the point. You would not miss it. So that's the essentially your, uh, the four, four piece plan. There's another thing that's rolling around that President Trump tried to do an executive order um, and didn't ever get it, really wasn't able to get it done. And that is to be able to move people, attorneys who work on uh, policy and move them out if they're not able to, if they're resistors. 
and it's I'm not focused on that. There's a lot of other people are. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's when anytime you get in a fight with attorneys, you know you're going to be in a lawsuit, and your lawsuits can be three years in a federal court that's uh, been stacked by Barack Obama to be against us. So I don't know that you win the lawsuit, and as a result, I prefer to spend things that can be done in the first hundred days of a new administration rather than things that may not ever happen because you're going to be tied up in court for the rest of your life. So those are things that can happen combined with the regulatory piece. Jay Beth, it fundamentally transforms the way this place works. You cut the brains out, which at least transform the brains on the civil service side, and you cut the tentacles off the octopus by taking the, the over, overreached regulations that are strangling America's capacity to live, capacity to compete. You do those two things, it would be the most fundamental transformation in this country that we've seen in at least 40 years. That is truly amazing. Um, and such, it, it, it's, it's mundane items. It's kind of in the weeds, and you have to understand how the bureaucracy works to understand what you're talking about. And yet, if we don't, as activists around the country, understand how the bureaucracy works, we can't fight it. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, Donald Trump was right. He touched on something we was talking about draining the swamp. The challenge is, it's really easy to say that. It's really hard to do it. And it's and it's not something that you know it's not a shiny object right now that yeah. that you can sit and point to but the fact is this is the hard work this is why why i like getting to do what i do the fight um, the so fight like to get in and because ultimately if you're going to be in a fight and in, if you're in politics you're going to be in a fight you might be able to be in a fight that when you come out the other end and you win it mattered right and the truth is, my group's small. There's a lot of groups that can, you know, can pick, can be in the big overall fight, and I help on those. I do what I can, and I we do a lot of media on those things. But the bottom line is, if you pick something that is somewhat mundane, but is fundamental to restoring America to being run by the people, not the bureaucrats, not the politicians by the people. If you want to restore that, you have to cut you have to go out and find a field that hasn't been tilled and go out and do what you got to do to cut the brush. And that's what this does. And I will know that that we're successful on it when suddenly it's being talked about by a whole bunch of people who end up on Fox News and the like and it'll be really exci- and they're all excited about it and and I'll sit back and I'll say, "Okay, we won. That that would be amazing, Rick. I hope that happens. Now, you worked in the labor department. Yes, ma'am. Have you worked in other parts of government as well? No, I, I well, I worked in con- I was uh, in a House Republican conference when I was a kid. But the by and large, I've been on the outside. I spent nine years a lot state lobbyist, National Rifle Association. Um, I worked my way through college, running political campaigns. The um, and my nine years at NRA taught taught me a very simple thing. If you follow the rules of the people who don't want you to be successful, you will never be successful. So don't follow them. Find other pathways. Don't do, you fall, You have to stay within guidelines, you know, but the fact of the matter is I passed, I'm in South Carolina, I passed a piece of legislation that never passed a committee it never it, it didn't do any of the things it's supposed to do it's being blocked by the by the chairman of the judiciary committee i and i passed this legislation because i decided i was going to pass the legislation and we i attached it to a bill that somebody wanted we did all this all this stuff outside the world or the rules and you know what on the last day of session i had somebody come and threaten me and say you need to get your bill off my off my bill and i said no I said, I showed him why, why it made sense to be there. And he got mad because somebody lied to him. And he went and he passed it. And, you know, so we had this big fight. I didn't play by their rules. And 30 years later, 
there's an article about how the city of Columbia in, in South Carolina was trying to pass gun control regulations, gun control laws. And the city attorney said, you can't do that. There's this obscure law that was passed 30 years before that, that's on the books to say you can't do it. Well, that's how that law got passed. And it made a difference. It and made it a difference. Thirty it, years, thirty right, years later, right. the gun controllers came in and said, "We want to do, we want to ban semi-automatic firearms," and they weren't able to because because we didn't play by the rules. We played by our we we played fair. Those were all rules, but they and weren't legally, the way you, you it play, wasn't it was, legally. It, we, but it wasn't the rules that they wanted us to play by. Right. Because if you're, nobody ever wants eggs broken. You know, they've all got a nice little, neat, their own neat little deal, and nobody wants their, their apple their apple cart overturned. And if you're going to change things, you have to overturn apple carts. And that's why Donald Trump, and this is way off base, but that's why when Donald Trump gets in front of a judge and basically doesn't answer the questions the way the judge wants answered, he's saying, you've got a rigged system, I'm not playing by your rules, I'm delivering my message, and too bad. Right. And he's exactly right. Yes, exactly. And they're saying you can't talk outside of the court, so you might as well Too bad. talk inside. No, the you court. have to say this is the only place yeah. I can talk. Well, and, you you set yeah. the rules up, buddy. It's a and that is a and so it's one of the things that when we look at politicians, we look at people who we might want to elect. Find people who find ways to get things done not people who just sit there and are glad, gonna be glad to be there. Okay, now one thing that I think is important to, that I wanna go back to for just a second. Um, when you talk talked about President Trump, I, I think everyone who loves President Trump and people who don't like him certainly like to say, well, he's supposed to know so much about people. He was an expert on hiring people and he couldn't get it the, the swamp drained. Well. Listening to what you were describing about how it works inside of the federal government, that is not the way a normal business works. If no. somebody doesn't log in or show up to work or isn't doing their job in a satisfactory manner in the real world, you lose your job. Yep. You don't, you don't get to stay there. But what you're saying is basically, it isn't even worth the manager's time to try to fire the person so they can just skate by for years, maybe decades, undermine and resist and not work, and mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to fire them. So when he comes in as a businessman into the government, he's trying to apply the rules of business to how you operate the government, which would make it way more efficient and way more competitive and get a lot of things out of the way. But the government it, it has created all these rules to protect mm -hmm. people from actually operating like a Correct. A business. The government isn't a business. Right. Okay, just understand, it's right. not a business. And, you know, I, I think, believe it or not, as strange as it may seem, Donald Trump, when he came in as president, thought that because he was president, he said to do something that people would do it. And even a lot of his own appointees weren't doing it. So let's just be clear, it wasn't just civil service. Right. I mean, he, had, he made some mistakes in terms of his, the people he put in certain positions. But, he made the assumption that I'm president, you know, I say this, you're gonna do, go do it because that's what happens in business. The, the fact is politics is manipulation. It isn't dictating things. Politics is getting people to do, do is manipulating people into doing what they, you want them to do. And people look at the word manipulate and they, they, look at the, they look at, oh, that's a bad word. Well, it's not a bad word. Because when you want your kid to go to bed, you manipulate them to go to bed. Okay, if you want somebody to do something, you have to find how to make it the, in their interest to do it. And that is a manipulation. So you have to, people have to understand that is what politics is. It's the art of manipulation. It's the art of, and by manipulation, it's making it so a politician believes that it's in their interest to do something. And that, is how we got, going back to the beginning, how we got the affirmatively furthering fair housing done. Because the Republican politicians said, we cannot have local zoning being done by, the, by bureaucrats in this, you know, looking at census tracts. 
That's not in our interests. We're going to get fired if we allow that to occur because people are going to get mad. They're going to find out two years, three years later, and they're going to be mad at us. So we better stop it now. So how do you manipulate people? When Jenny Beth goes and, or we've, We've got 100,000 people who subscribe to our thing. I've got half a million people who are on our Facebook page and the like. When I put stuff out and I say, hey, we need to get on this, part of that manipulation is people getting involved. It's people saying, this matters to me in contacting the member of Congress multiple times. Right. It's, a, it, it, it's part of that manipulation. It's part of, but it's also part of how our government's supposed to work because it's the consent of the governed. And if the people in D.C. only believe that the governed they only listen to the people who live around them and they live in dc let's just be clear they live in dc when you have a government shutdown and you go to your church and the pastor at the church says there's a government shutdown and we're opening up the food banks to all the federal employees which happened at my church way out 30 miles from dc everybody sits there and goes oh the government shutdown is hurting people those are the people who are in government. Those are the people who are your staff people. Those are the people who are actually your congressmen in many cases. That's their input. Their circle of influence is inside the Beltway. And their staff circle of influence is inside the Beltway. It's an echo chamber. It's an echo chamber. And I, th I think everybody knows this. The reason they didn't like people actually telling them who they think should be speaker was because it was breaking down their system, was following their rules. <laughs> Overturn the apple cart. <laughs> Overturn the apple cart. And you know what? The reason, you, we, the reason we ended up with Mike Johnson as speaker and not a much more liberal member of the House of Representatives is because they remembered all those people called for, for Jim Jordan. If we don't get a conservative speaker, we're gonna get creamed in primaries. And that was the value. And, you know, the, I, I was involved, as you know, you were way out front on that in terms of supporting Jim Jordan, and rightfully so. We got a speaker who's a conservative speaker because of the people calling for Jim Jordan and the effect Wait, that had. Well, and, and calling and calling and calling over and over yeah. and over, and it was in the self-interest of all of the politicians to listen to those people, and it was in the self-interest of the employees to make sure their bosses were doing what the constituency wanted yep. if they wanted the calls to end. Well, and if they wanted to keep their job. Yeah, Because ultimately, every one of those employees who picks up the phone is an at-will employee, and the next congressman isn't necessarily going to keep them. Probably won't keep them. Unlike so, the rest of the federal government. Unlike, unlike the rest of the federal government. <laughs> yeah. So so people understand, if you, if you don't take anything else out of this, and your voice does matter. It may not always seem that way, but the Jim Jordan speaker race is an exact example of how the effect, the, the, the wave, you know, you have a big wave and then you have the after waves. The after wave of the Jim Jordan getting, not getting the speakership was the House Republicans said, we have to have a conservative speaker. That's why Tom Emmert, when he gets the nomination, lasts four hours. Right. It's a, because he wasn't a Republican speaker. And what's more, with Mike Johnson, they also said something different. They said, we want a new generation of leadership. Right. And that is probably the most significant thing that happened out of that speaker's race. And it's because the people broke the system and changed the way the votes happened. So people, if you were one of those people called, God bless you. Um, if you emailed, God bless you. You were heard. You just weren't necessarily heard the way you thought you might be. Well, they were calling um, for what Jim Jordan represents, which is not what we were getting from McCarthy. It right. is not what we were getting from Paul Ryan and John Boehner before before McCarthy. It was a change in how they wanted to see Washington work. So they weren't, they were calling for Jim Jordan, but they truly were calling for new leadership. And at the end, they got what they were asking for, which is new leadership. And it isn't, and conservative leadership, and someone who cares about the values we've been advocating for and is going to do more than give occasional lip service to it. Right, and what we also got was we saw Jim Jordan going after the weaponization of government in the way he can at the head of the Judiciary Committee. And in some respects, the swamp fears Jim Jordan far more as chairman of the Judiciary Committee with a speaker who will back him 
yes. than they do than they ever would where a speaker is having to make deals with everybody to to live in this puzzle palace. Right. So it is a so in a lot of respects, it truly was a win win. Yes, absolutely. Well, Rick, I appreciate your time today. You've given people a lot of things to think about. We have to attack the regulatory state. The Supreme Court decision allows uh, allows a unique opportunity to really go back in and go, wait, these regulations don't line up with what Congress originally passed the law to say. And we have to attack the the the, the civil servants I use the word servant in air quotes, but we've got to go through and make sure that they're actually doing the work they're supposed to do and doing the work of the president who the people elect, not just what they want to do. Because we didn't elect them, we elected the president. They're supposed to be doing what the president says, which is who the people elect. That's exactly right, and I think there's, we can get that done. These are not, these are not pie in the sky tests. These are things that can get done. And if we have a concerted focus on them, they will get done and it will fundamentally transform the federal government to its rightful place as being not the dominant thing that just kind of absorbs everything in this country. Right. America's strength is that it's it's of the people. It's the people. It's not the government, it's the people and we have to rebalance that relationship and we're going to do it. Where can people go to get more information about your go to, work? Go to getliberty.org. Getliberty.org, uh, uh, yeah. it's a great website, yeah, Get Liberty. Get Liberty, you can just sign, and I would encourage anybody to just um, subscribe for a free newsletter. We send something out every day with different things are going on, there's a lot of polling, and I've got cartoons, I've got all sorts of fun stuff in there, but, um, but it's on issues, we try to focus on issues that are being ignored that are kind of falling out by the way. So we write about stuff that's, you know, that you can read it, you know, that a lot of people are talking about. But the fact of the matter is, um, my goal is to find places that are linchpins of big government and pull them out and make it so government becomes a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and not a government that's adverse, that's an adversary to the individual individual freedoms that we enjoy and we're endowed by our creator to enjoy. Rick Manning, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, thank you. That is Rick Manning with Americans for Limited Government. You can get more information about his organization at getliberty.org. I'm Jenny Beth Martin, and this is The Jenny Beth Show. The Jenny Beth Show is hosted by Jenny Beth Martin, produced by Kevin Mooneyhan, and directed by Luke Livingston. The Jenny Beth Show is a production of Tea Party Patriots Action. For more information, visit TeaPartyPatriots.org. If you like this episode, let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment or a five-star review. And if you want to be the first to know every time we drop a new episode, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for whichever platform you're listening on. If you do these simple things, it will help the podcast grow and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much.